It's a Q&A. Welcome. I'm set up in my studio. I feel like a bit of an imposter because I'm not really doing anything. I'm just chit chatting. I put a little question sticker out on Instagram and out on YouTube and you guys asked some really cool questions and I'm here to answer them today. We're going to cover how to price pieces, how to run a kiln, like how much it costs to run a kiln, what I listen to in the studio and we're going to talk about imposter syndrome as well. So let's get going. First question is, how do I price my pieces? Um, so this is quite difficult sometimes because there's lots of variables within clay and I find that it is actually quite hard to kind of put a proper number on it. And sometimes when you do use this formula that I'm about to share with you, it kind of doesn't quite work and it ends up being a really expensive piece or kind of just like completely out of whack with what other potters are charging. So to start with, you need to work out what your hourly rate is. And that can be quite hard. If you're just starting out, then you maybe want to charge a little bit less. If you're more experienced and you know what you're doing and you're confident and comfortable with your work, then you can charge more for your time. Whatever price you land on, it should be at least minimum wage. Don't be undercutting yourself. You gotta pay yourself for your work. Once you have decided what your hourly rate is, then you can use this formula. Time spent times your hourly rate plus cost of materials, and that is clay, and that is all your overheads, which is the price of your studio, um, the price it costs to run your kilns, your business insurance, things like that. You need to include all of that in your cost of materials, and that will get you the price that it costs to make a piece. After that, you times it by two, and that is your wholesale price. And that includes profit, it includes your hourly rate, it includes all of your overhead. And then to get your retail price, which is the price that you should be um, charging on your website or that retailers would be charging your work for, you would times it by two again. And so it does end up sometimes costing some crazy amount. So to work out like exactly how long a piece takes as well, you need to kind of just time it. So time how long it takes you to wedge your clay for one piece, then how long it takes to throw it or to hand build it, how long it takes to trim it, how long it takes to add your handle, whatever it is, how long it takes to glaze as well. And so that's kind of how you know how long one piece takes and you can kind of decide how long um, one piece versus, I don't know, 100 pieces takes, maybe it's a bit quicker. Or you can kind of apply that same formula to similar pieces of a similar size. Ceramics is a really difficult one because there's lots of downtime in it. There's lots of stuff drying on the shelves or waiting to be fired or actually being fired. And do you kind of charge for that? Up to you. I don't because it makes the prices sometimes just absolutely bonkers or sometimes I'll be out of the studio for a while so I can't actually fire a piece in time so it's kind of just waiting for two weeks on a shelf and like it's not really fair to charge that in the price. Like when you get a little bit more experience you're going to be way quicker so if you work out a piece and it ends up being like 500 quid for a cup then I don't know unless you're very savvy and you know how to find a market of people who are going to spend 500 pounds on a cup, then you have to kind of go a little bit vibe based after that. Anyway, use that formula. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then kind of apply a little bit of logic to it. Do some research around other people's pieces as well and decide kind of where it fits in the market. If you're a beginner, it's going to be less. If you're really experienced and you've got loads of people lining up to buy your work, then the demand is higher so you can charge a little bit more. So yeah, hope that helps. Next one is also kind of cost related. How much does it cost to run a kiln? I want to set up a kiln at home but don't know if it's worth it. There's lots of variables with how much it costs to run a kiln. So you've got to think about the size of your kiln, how much your power bill costs, how efficient your kiln is, the age of your element, and how long you actually fire your kiln for as well. So my kilns cost somewhere between like seven to 15 to maybe 20 pounds of firing. I can fit quite a lot in my kilns. So that is sort of divided by each piece, obviously. If you already have a kiln, you can work out how much it costs to fire by. If you already have a kiln, working out how much it costs to run is pretty straightforward. So you need to go to your electricity meter and make a note of what the kilowatt 
amount on there is at the moment and then you need to put your kiln on ideally fire at night time so nothing else is kind of drawing on the power and then as soon as it's finished take another note of the electricity meter and the differential in the kilowatts is how much power it has drawn and then you can times that by how much it costs per kilowatt for your electricity and that's how much your firing costs my power bill recently changed to from something like 17p per kilowatt to something i think it's 76p per kilowatt now like this this is crazy increase and i need to perform this test again because i need to actually make sure that my pieces are priced correctly but it's always it's always I don't know, lots of variables. I hope that helps. Do I have a playlist in my studio that I listen to? I'm kind of a audiobooks or a podcast girly rather than a music girly. That's not true. I listen to music, obviously. But I really like kind of getting into a different world when I'm at the wheel or doing studio stuff. So I've recently just finished listening to Julia Fox's audiobook, Down the Drain. Oh my God, Julia Fox, I'm in love with you. Oh my God, my book, of course. Yeah, it's um, so far a masterpiece, if I do say so myself. What a woman, I love her. I highly recommend that. It's free on Spotify, I think, if you have premium. I'm also listening to a book at the moment called The Beasting by Paul Murray, which is quite good. And I listen to podcasts at the moment. I'm listening to a podcast called Search Engine by PJ Vote. If you were a Reply All fan uh, back in the day, then this is PJ's thing on his own. <laughs> it's pretty good. But when I do listen to music, I'll listen to, I'm always in a different mood. Often I'll listen to classical music, love a bit of classical, or I'll listen to like old school Lady Gaga or something specific. It's quite sweet when I it's quite sweet when I unload the kiln sometimes and I'll look at a piece and be like, oh, I was listening to this moment in Julia Fox's audiobook, for example, when I was making this. And I, that piece kind of holds that memory. And it's quite nice because then I'll sell it and be like, I have this little secret. And it's quite nice like selling a piece that has like a little memory of mine embedded into it and someone kind of takes it away with them and puts their own little memories in. It's pretty cute. Someone has asked about my speckle effect in my clay and do I add that myself or does it come in the clay? I buy it like that. I buy my clay with the speckle in it. It's like a grog with some kind of metal in there. If you can't find a speckle clay that's similar, then you can make your own by adding iron spangles to your clay. Right, someone asked me, will I go full time again with ceramics? And the answer is yes. In fact, I'm coming back within the next month or so full time, which I'm very excited about. So I was full time for about five years. Excuse me, my microphone. I was full time for about five years and it was great, but I kind of just burnt out really hard. I've touched on this in a few videos and one day I'm gonna make a video about burnout and kind of how I got through it, but it's honestly quite an emotional subject, so I kind of, I don't quite have the energy to do it. But I was just making too many pots for too little money, working really hard, stressing out about everything all the time, and just ended up honestly hating pottery because it, I, 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 my heart wasn't in it. I didn't have the energy to be creative at all. So I got a job for about 18 months as a sales and marketing manager for this really lovely community craft organization and yeah i'll be finishing up there soon and i'll be back here full time which is very very exciting again i i will touch on burnout in another video i think but i'm gonna have to reframe kind of how i do it and so i'm gonna focus more on youtube videos and focus more on kind of social media stuff and um, approach marketing my work in a different way and I want to do other fun things as well, like I've written a book and that's something that was incredibly fun and incredibly rewarding and I want to do more of that. I want to have the freedom to be able to, this is just an example, but if you want me to come and work with you, please let me know. Um, I've worked on like a set for a short film once in the, as a costume assistant and it was so much fun. I want to do stuff like that again, work in the art department or props or something like that in films because I just think it's an incredible world that I would love to be part of. So 
yeah, if you need like a props assistant or a stylist, let me know. I also am gonna do like a little bit of social media consulting. So for small brands like myself, how I started, I kind of worked it all out. I think that there is a really nice market for people who want to start doing something similar to what I've done or have a small brand that's just kind of getting going. If they need help with social media and digital marketing, then I'm gonna, yeah, do a little bit of consulting. So again, get in contact if you want that because I am very excited to kind of go down that little journey. Basically, I love making ceramics so much, but I want to protect it because it is my first love, you know, it's the, the thing that I want to be very good at, but I want to be very good at it for a very long time. And I know that I've already burnt out doing it before and I want to be careful to not do that again. So kind of looking at myself as like a general creative is really exciting and um, yeah, something I'm really looking forward to. When did you know it was time to set up an independent studio? So I moved to London in 2016. I moved into a shared studio with like 10 or 15 other potters. I had a little desk space and I had some shelves and we all shared the kilns and the wheels and the space. And it was great for me when I was just starting out. I learned a lot of stuff, I met a lot of cool people, but then it kind of got to the point where I needed to do my own thing and that point was when I started getting commissions and I started honestly monopolizing the studio and I was taking up all the shelf space. Anyone who's made plates for a restaurant knows that plates are such a hog of space and so I was like taking up every surface here and every surface on the table and all of my shelves and like sneaking stuff onto other people's shelves and it was fine but it just kind of wasn't an appropriate use for the space and it wasn't really fair on other people. I also didn't have complete autonomy of the kiln at all or if things went wrong, like I couldn't quite fully troubleshoot as I needed to. So I knew it was time to kind of fly the nest, leave the nest <laughs> and make my own little nest. So that's what I did. I found a garage that I moved into and I painted the floor pink and I bought a kiln and I bought a little wheel and um, I kind of got set up. It was really lonely and it was really hard and it was um, difficult making that transition between being surrounded by people all the time and being surrounded by other influences and other voices and having to work within those constraints to suddenly being out by myself and having no safety net. It was really scary but yeah, it got me to where I am today and I'm very happy that I kind of took the plunge when I needed to. Someone's asked me if I'm happy. Damn, that's quite full on. Um, yeah, I am happy. I suffer from anxiety and I suffer from like low moods and like depressive kind of moments, but as a whole, I'm really happy. Thank you for asking. I hope that you're happy too. <laughs> and then straight back into like ceramics chat. Do I add shipping to the prices of my pieces online? Um, no, I don't, I don't include it within the rate, but I add it on top at checkout. I would love to be able to include it, but I'm just a girl, I can't afford it. Places like Amazon and like other big corporations, they have huge profit margins and they have like partnerships with carriers that they can charge appropriate prices, that they can charge nothing for shipping. But I don't have that, I don't have a very big profit margin and I don't ship enough to kind of have a partnership with a carrier that ends up being cheap enough to kind of include it in the price. So yeah, sadly I have to add on to my purchases. It is what it is. Someone's asked, how long did it take me to make the majority of my income through ceramics? Uh, listen, I'm not gonna lie. I am incredibly privileged and I kind of, have only been able to do what I do because I have a partner um, and we share income. <laughs> and so he's propped me up a lot of my career and like I'm incredibly grateful for that, but I realize that kind of this, what I'm able to do isn't necessarily available to everyone. Um, I'm very, very lucky. Um, like we, have had times where we've been very poor or very stretched for money because I have chosen to do this with my life. And I think anyone in the world of ceramics kind of knows that we're doing it for the love, not for the money. 
sadly, because it is an incredibly difficult craft and it's hard to hustle all the time to make enough money to make ends meet. But it took a few years, basically, is the answer. You know, I'm able to kind of top up my income through things like royalties from my book and my YouTube channel and my domestica course. I am able to teach. I've had a job for a while. Yeah, there's sort of other things that help me with my income when I either don't have enough commissions or I don't have um, the mental energy to be putting out work online just constantly. I don't know, that might be a bit of a bleak answer. It's definitely possible to do it, it's just, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of um, community, <laughs> I think. Okay, let's do some quick fire ones. Tips to prepare for my first market. You can watch this video here. <laughs> What is your favorite underglaze? I don't really use underglaze. I prefer using slip rather than underglaze because it doesn't have flux in it, so it doesn't affect the glaze in any way. Someone's asked for tips to avoid pinholes and can you reglaze a piece if it has pinholes? I would suggest fettling the piece before it's fired, after it's glazed. So you sort of like rub in the glaze into the pinholes if you see them and also maybe bisque fire your piece for a little bit longer, like put on a 10 minute soak or a 15 minute soak. And you know what? Yeah, you can reglaze it. If you already don't like it, then there's a moment here to learn something. So you can give it a go, see what happens. Make a note of the results. Someone asked a two prong question, how old are you and why don't you do ceramics full time? I'm 30 years old and I've answered the full time thing above. <laughs> What's my ceramic dream build? I don't know, to be honest. I kind of am living the dream already. Probably throwing something really big. I generally have to throw vases in two pieces because I'm not very good at throwing big. So that's something for me to work on. And I think it would be an incredibly satisfying thing for me to crack is just like throwing massive things. How to find ceramic studios in London? This, I suppose, also works for everywhere. Um, it depends what you want. If you want a shared studio, then I guess just Google or talk to ceramicists and ask where they practice. Um, oh my God, my microphone. You can um, go on Instagram and find studios. If you're looking for a space by yourself, then I'd suggest looking up like commercial studios to rent and ask if you can have a kiln in there. That's, yeah, that's how I would do it. How to get better at consistency. I'm a beginner and it's hard to imagine making five cups all the same. Practice. Sorry, sorry to tell you. Honestly, just make like 20 or 30 pieces all at once. Um, wedge up all of your clay and then just sit at your wheel and make 30 pieces and kind of know that you're not gonna keep any of them. Put them aside after you've thrown them all. Look at them and decide what went wrong, what went right see if you've learned anything from it and try and do everything consistently so like always open to the same width so that you're starting with the same base set up a gauge or a stick like a throwing stick so that you just throw to that point on the wheel and i think you'll you'll find some success and then like sleep on it go home sleep on it and come back in and you tend to kind of have embedded the skills a little bit after that um, I think this is going to be the last question because it's a good one and to be honest it's a long answer. Um, if I didn't get to your question I'm really sorry. I'll do another q and I think if people are interested. Somebody has asked me did I deal with imposter syndrome when I was starting out and do I still suffer from it? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Me and imposter syndrome are best friends. When I think about imposter syndrome, like I, I know I deal with it often, but I can think about some very specific times when I dealt with it and it almost stopped me in my tracks and I almost reversed and didn't go ahead with it. When I got my very, very first commission for ceramics, I almost emailed back and just said, sorry, no, even though I had reached out to them. When I was contacted, by a publisher to write a book about hand building ceramics, I almost said no. When I was asked to go in for an interview for my job, I almost didn't do it. And just last week I was editing a video and I quote, I said, I'm so stupid, I don't know how to do this. How should I start? I'm so stupid, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> what? <laughs> Little past me broke like 
present me's heart. It was awful to hear that because honestly, all of these things I did end up doing and I did find success in them. Like I did make ceramics for that commission and a few months later they contacted me and wanted more work. I did write a whole ass book about hand building ceramics and people buy it and people like it and maybe I'm not the best hand builder in the world but I'm still a hand builder so I can do that. I did go for that job interview and I got the job and I was very good at that job. Our brains are so powerful and just last week I did end up filming and editing that whole video and it's online and people like it and watch it. It's good. I think that imposter syndrome is one of the most like insidious things that our brains do to ourselves and I suppose it keeps us safe in some way but it is also it stops us from taking action and I think then it can kind of become this awful cycle where you don't do things, you don't take risks because it is really scary. But we are all capable of doing very difficult things and kind of overcoming the fear to become a more successful or a better person. I don't know, however you want to frame that. But also like what's the worst that can happen in some of these situations? Like, you know, maybe some people don't like my book. It's fine. It's not my problem. It's theirs. Maybe someone doesn't buy your pot. It's fine. Again, it's their problem. It's not your problem. Maybe someone's not going to watch my YouTube video. It's fine. Maybe you go to a job interview, you bomb the interview, you don't get the job. It's fine. Obviously that one maybe has slightly more ramifications if you need money, but <laughs> like you will get a job at some point and you are able to do stuff. It's just your brain is keeping you safe. Saying this out loud is a nice reminder to myself to kind of continue to do difficult things and kind of encourage you guys to do difficult things too. Okay, that's it. Thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you for asking all these really cool questions. Um, again, I'm sorry if I haven't answered yours, but hopefully you've gained some insight from this video. Um, I'll be back next week with another video. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at may.ceramics and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.